Uh, before we start, I wanted to bring up a couple of comments. One is that Austrian economics, which was theorized at the University of Vienna uh, back in beginning in eight, 17, uh, 1881, is free market economics and it's all deductible. So your logic uh, will allow you to understand all Austrian economic theory perfectly. Now it may take a little effort to get there, but there won't be any conflict between your logic and observation and the theory. And the second is that if you understand some of the aspects here of modern monetary theory, um, it will improve your uh, relentless truth seeking. And in many cases, it will put you ahead of PhD economists. Um, uh, not in all cases, but in many cases. So don't, don't approach it by saying, oh, that's economics and it's complicated and I never studied economics and I don't understand it. My message, you, you can understand it perfectly and better than most people. Uh, the second is that it's an exercise in truth seeking. So we have a lot of theories floating around, a lot of ideas in the modern world and a good number of them are completely wrong. So we have to be able to see through the idea and the theory to, to get to the truth. Uh, I want to use kind of a seminar so that we can discuss these as we go along. Because you get to the end and you might have had a question and you, um, it's just easier to ask it when that topic is uh, at hand. And, and then another lesson in teaching. So one of the things that I've learned over the years, I learned in a very short period of time a very profound lesson. And I think it's something that we can deploy over time in our schools. Some things are very, very important in life. And many of them uh, don't take a long period of time to learn. <clears throat> so the other day, Captivir is being, getting involved in acoustics. <clears throat> and in three minutes, an engineer explained to me um, what reverb is, how you measure it in milliseconds, and what is not acceptable and the fact there's a meter that will measure it. So you could take an eighth grade student, explain reverberation to them in a big building, which we often see. Why is it occurring? Uh, is, that a, is that three quarters of a second or a second and a quarter? You can now measure that in your brain and you completely understand reverberation. So the, the question would be, why wouldn't architects understand this? Okay, evidently they missed that lesson. So many places you go into, you have a reverb. It makes it very hard to understand if the person has any type of an accent, can't understand them at all. Kind of a little off subject. So modern monetary theory, you have to wonder who the, who the heck comes up with this stuff. So I'm going to state my position out of the gate <coughs> that it's completely non-truthful. It's completely absurd and ridiculous. And we're going to explore where did these concepts come from and, and why did they gain standing? Uh, there's a, an author uh, that just wrote a book on this. His name is Desmond from Belgium. And he says that the more ridiculous the idea, the more people tend to buy into it. Now that's very counterintuitive, but you're witnessing it in our current society. Um, it's post-Keynesian. Anybody knows anything about uh, Lord Keynes, uh, 1920, 30, Keynesian economics? And the basic idea, he said, if we have a bad economy, the government should overspend to stimulate the economy. But he also said that in a good economy, i.e. now, the government should run a surplus. That's what Keynes said. 100 years fast forward, government officials attribute any wacky idea they have to Keynes. Uh, so much so that uh, Richard Nixon, somewhere around 1971, uh, said we're all Keynesians now. Uh, basically, we're all, we all are in non-truth and we make it up as we go along. And for those of you, most of you are too young to remember Nixon, wage and price controls didn't work out too well, did they? Caused a havoc in the economy, caused massive inflation, took many, many years and a lot of pain to get through it. So these ideas are not just bad ideas, they are administering pain to normal citizens. You're witnessing that uh, today uh, with uh, inflation. 
So what is the basic theory of MMT? The government can spend an unlimited amount of dollars, and if we just left it at there, you might say, uh, well, that doesn't sound right, but there has to be a little hook. There's always a hook. They do it to create a more just society, more fairness, more kindness. Okay, so that's the hook. And first I wanna address the hook, why it doesn't make any sense. And if you think about, just heard a beautiful lecture on history, how he connected you know, 25 year old, 35 year old history to what we're doing today, the, whether it was the Corinthian columns or the ingenuity of the Americans at uh, Normandy, he connected it rather beautifully. And so what do these MMT say? Uh, if, if we're not collecting enough in tax, i.e. currently, we borrow the money, okay? So if someone's not paying attention, then say, well, okay, we're doing good things, we can tax or borrow the money, That's, that sounds okay, and you just fall right into it. Uh, but if you look at the current point in time, of all the money borrowed in America in 2023, half of it is borrowed by the government. So think about this conceptually. And what does that do? Uh, the 10 years, everybody know what a 10 year treasury is? A 10 year government bond is considered the marker uh, data point uh, for bonds. The 10 year hit a, a near term high of 4.8 this week. As the 10 year and the 30 year continue to rise, what does it do? It crowds out the private because a small business person says they can't borrow at 4.8. Maybe they're borrowing 7.8, 8.8, 9.8, 12 points. At some point, the private investor, the small business person, the homeowner says, I can't afford to buy and pay that level of interest. Um, so it has an absolute effect and it's happening this year and you can witness it, just bring up the treasuries. Here's another interesting thing about the treasuries. So people would tend to say, an old widow, an older person, an old man would say, well, I'll just buy government bonds and they're, they're perfectly safe and I'll get my interest. If you bought a government bond in 2020, 21, 2021, and the interest was somewhere between close to nothing to a half a 50 basis point, which is half of 1%, or it was one and a half or 2%, some of those bonds are currently trading in the market. The $1,000 bond are trading at $550. So we, we've all experienced 20% drop in the stock market. We had a 40% drop in the market in 2008, 2009. It's like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. It just happened to bonds in your lifetime, right in front of your face. A 45% drop. So if that person wanted to sell their bond today, they're gonna take a 45% haircut. This is a direct result of massive government borrowing in the marketplace. Um, uh, and then if you get back to saying, we're gonna have a more just society, you just heard the lecture. What creates a just society? Individuals, the way we act. Uh, governments rarely create a just society. They could talk about it, they could encourage it, but a just society is created by individuals, not by governments, not by mandates. They can mandate, there's a mandate in North Carolina, some of our leaders might know about it. In the third grade, all students have to read on grade level. It's a law in North Carolina, okay? That's a good thing, right? <clears throat> Do all students leaving the third grade read no, half of them don't read on grade level. This is a law, this is absolute. Uh, this is fairness within our society because people make the difference, not laws, not government. That's a profound lesson. So the idea that you're gonna bankrupt a society because you have good intentions is a horrifically bad idea. That's a primary message. Does anybody have any comments or thoughts on that? Is it fairly ludicrous when you think about it that you would literally bankrupt the greatest country in the history of the world <clears throat> over a false theory and a false premise of some kind of social justice, 
a kinder, gentler society, etc. Doesn't even make a little bit of sense, right? It doesn't even pass a laugh test. I think if it was properly presented uh, to some alert eighth grade students, they'd completely understand it. And I know that because I talk to middle schoolers. Um, they understand these things and they can debate them. Uh, Thales has a debate class and I'm sure at one point in time, MMT will be one of the uh, debate issues for the Thales Academy. So large scale government um, spending creates enormous national challenges, incredible national challenges, because it's sucking the life out of the individual. Now Thales Academy operates on the premise, premise of Julian Simon, economist, and many others. The ultimate resource is you, the individual. The individual brain solves future problems, not the collective group. I actually had this debate last night with one of my nieces and she didn't go to Thales, so she probably doesn't understand some of these things. Never heard such a concept before, that actually individuals were more important than the collective. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little sidebar. <laughs> actually, never heard of the concept. Well, the collective is always more important than the individual. Don't you care about the collective? No, I care about the individual. Well, what did the historian tell you today? It's the individuals that make history, and they are most important. And if they are well formed, as they will be coming out of Thales, they're going to have, make enormous contributions. I was just talking to some teachers and some anecdotes from some of these schools. A, a lot of our students, since we've been around 25 years, are adults, and they're in professional, uh, many, many professions, and they're making a profound difference in the world because they're very well formed. Now, one of the goals of uh, MMT is ending involuntary unemployment. Is anybody familiar with any involuntary unemployment today? Could be transitional. Kid lose a job and takes a few weeks or a few months to get a job. Um, but if anybody really wants a job that they are skilled for, they probably can get that job in a modern society. So much so that employers are begging people. They'll do anything to get people to come to work for them and further to try to keep them. So we have a big emphasis on how do we keep the people we have? How do we keep them happy? How do we do the right things for them? Um, and in a booming economy, that's what you get. Opportunities for everybody. It's not perfect, it, it ebbs and flows, but largely it works. Employment is created by business, not government. I don't know if anybody knows this, but there's, there's various surveys that are being done. And Federal workers somewhere between 15 and 25 percent in any given day are actually in the office. So think about this. So if we had 15 percent of our teachers in, in office on a given day, it wouldn't work too well, right? So, you, <laughs> so you, have, you have to have more and more federal workers to do less work. Uh, so the idea that, the, so they are creating jobs, but they're useless jobs. And in, we, we had the word this morning, permissionless. Who do we have to get? The producers in the modern society have to ask permission from the non-producers to do things. Think about that conceptually. Uh, if we want to build a school, we have to go to people who don't produce anything and ask them, can we build a school? And mostly what they say is, we'll let you know in a couple of years. I mean, think about this conceptually, okay? There's so Thales deals with this every day. Uh, we got approval yesterday to open the Cary schools. They have a, a CO now or a temporary CO. But if they don't give us a tem the temporary CO, we can't go to class on Monday. Okay, Is it, would there be anything just terribly wrong with the building and by the time they've inspected it for a year? Not very likely, right? So business creates real jobs and those jobs are aligned with consumer preference. So if you guys don't buy peanut butter anymore, all the peanut butter jobs are lost. It's not complicated. It's really, really simple. If you decide you really like peanut butter and you buy, buy a little extra and use a little bit more, more jobs are created. Very uncomplicated. It's consumer choice. The basis of Austrian economics from Karl Menger, 1781, consumer choice. Prior to 1781, maybe Adam Smith, some people did understand this, but generally economists did not understand it whatsoever. So when Menger went out with his theory of 
the consumers create the market, he was an oddball. He was like, get out of here. So much so that he gave lectures. So he's, he's in the University of Vienna. He would give lectures in um, Germany. And um, they came up with this idea, oh, he's an Austrian, like he's an idiot, <laughs> okay? That's where Aust the term Austrian economics came from because the Germans were sacrosanct in what they believed uh, in terms of economics and obviously other things. And it, and it leads to trouble. Federalism was the basis of our constitution and the way this country is created. And it was the way things got worked out that mostly the states were in control because there's a lot of difference between Maine and North Carolina or California and North Carolina. There's major differences and the founders understood those would never fully be resolved, but you could choose to live in Maine or, or North Carolina or California at your choice, so everybody could find a place that was comfortable with what they believed. And that's the whole basis, and they titled it Federalism. So their idea is that most problems would be solved at the source. Anybody that's read de Tocqueville? De Tocqueville was so amazed when he came here, he actually came to write about prisons in America. But he started making these observations and saying, this is really interesting. Uh, they don't have any federal government. These problems are solved at a very local level. And it's actually incredible. Um, Michael Novak uh, writes about the same thing, kind of basically the same theme that by 1850, Ohio, the state of Ohio had more colleges and universities than all of Europe in 1850. Can you, can you even imagine such a thing? And why is it? This because of you. Human productivity, Julian Simon, allowing people to use their talents. So what is, uh, I told somebody this this morning, what is Thales Academy? It's a place where teachers and leaders and thinkers can use their own brains, can help develop children, and it's a beautiful thing. It's an absolutely beautiful, incredible thing. Uh, that's the basis of America. That's what made America. Now, do we have warts? Yeah, he covered some of the warts today, absolutely. Uh, did we make mistakes over the years? Yes. And one of the things Andrew told me after the speech was, he made a critical comment about somebody that lived, you know, in 500 AD. <laughs> and his teacher said to him, Andrew, let me explain something to you. Don't ever put today's morals on someone that lived five, 300, 500, 1,000 years ago. Don't ever do that. Don't ever make any judgments on them because you didn't live their life and you didn't live in those times. And obviously over time, even though it's hard to comprehend, the world actually is getting better. So that at formerly, in formal times, they didn't like you, they just killed you on the spot. Uh, or they did really ugly things to you we have much less of that. Now there's still people do ugly things, et cetera, et cetera, but we have a more civilized society today than we did. It's still not ideal uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it's better than it was a long time ago. So modern monetary theory where the federal government's gonna spend any amount of money that it wants to completely undermines federalism. So the, uh, we'll cover that later. The, um, the issues that the federal government's involved in, what actually happens. Now, this is one I, I hope you will make some comments on, because it may be a little hard for you to digest. Ludwig von Mises, who was the great Austrian thinker, he uh, was a protege of Menger. Menger wasn't his teacher, but he did uh, meet him uh, during his time at the University of Vienna. And Mises is a genius, and he, he thought these things very carefully, and some of the statements he's, he, he makes me take a little time to digest. So here's what Mises says. All government interventions make the problem worse and lead to more interventions. So let's think of recently COVID. So we had an intervention. We're gonna make everybody stay home. We're gonna close all the schools. We're gonna close the churches. And, and what happened? We have 20% unemployment overnight. People just lost their jobs overnight because of this intervention. What, did the what was the government's reaction? Oh, we've created a problem. Modern monetary theory, we can solve the problem. 
we'll just create a $2 billion spending bill and we'll pass out money to everybody on the planet. Many individuals were receiving unemployment at 2x what they made at their regular job. Now, now, did those folks want to go back to their regular job when it ran out? No, okay. Once we're spoiled, we're spoiled. <laughs> okay, it's the nature of life. So Misa says, all government interventions lead to trouble and lead to more interventions. We could go through chapter and verse on that. Anybody have any comments on that? Is that, is that too shocking to, to actually have to process today? Think about these interventions over the years. The U.S. Department of Education. We're going to improve education. Does any, nobody really believes that, do they? Uh, but, but how much money do they spend? I don't know, $100 billion a year. They interfere with education. We have no child left behind. Which uh, Bill Peterson, student of Mises, my mentor, said, what it is is all children left behind because of this stupidity. If we can recognize that in real time, you're smarter than all these PhDs that are thinking of this nonsense, or these alleged experts. There's an enormous danger in trusting experts. Uh, my father wouldn't even allow us to use that term. He says there are no experts, okay? We're, we're always exploring the truth, we're always exploring the best idea, and we're not gonna be led around by a group of experts. That obviously doesn't work. Covert shut, shutting, five to seven billion dollars. It's creating severe distortions within our economy today. And those distortions are not gonna go away easily. Uh, did government spending alleviate poverty? So I can remember when Johnson announced in 1965, the great society, we're gonna eliminate poverty. Go around to the cities today. Okay, we had some real problems in 67 in Detroit. Uh, we, we had real problems in the cities, but nothing compared to what we're dealing with today after the government interventions. Uh, the war on poverty, this is based on uh, inflation adjusted. It spent something like $22 trillion to solve poverty. And, and by the way, we have $33 trillion in debt, so Whatever amount of money was spent, had it not been spent, it would have come directly out of debt, and we would have had a better work ethic, we would have had a better outcome. And essentially, what the war on poverty did was created a permanent welfare state. I grew up in primarily in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I was up there about a month ago, and I said, I'm going to go around to the neighborhoods that I traversed, that I walked around, that I rode my bike. And I came to this conclusion, not on the street I lived, it was almost somewhat, a little bit isolated from this, but as you walk around, I said, if I was born today and I lived in this neighborhood, I would have no hope in life, none. Um, poverty's everywhere, crime's everywhere, no good school to go to, no advocates that would, you know, Mrs. McGillicuddy, who would do something nice for you, who would teach you, um, doesn't exist anymore, no hope. Okay, so I'm trying to make, get across the point that while it may sound good on the surface and you may say, well, we're just trying to help these people, we're destroying these people with this kind of nonsense. Heritage sums it up, I think, perfectly. By breaking down the habits and the norms that lead to self-reliance Welfare generates a pattern of increasing intergenerational dependence. So growing up in one of those dependents, if you are the most superior, the most highly motivated person, you may be able to get out of there. But for the 98%, they're not going to be able to get out of that situation. They're going to live miserable lives. They're going to be afraid half their lives. And their lives are going to be not as productive as they could have been uh, if they had been self-reliant. So what is our goal at Thales Academy is to develop individuals who are more self-reliant, who can take care of themselves. Not only take care of themselves, they can take care of other people. Okay, so once you can take care of yourself, you can make a greater contribution uh, to the world. Now, <laughs> I was talking to some of my relatives last night who think uh, climate change is absolute. So there's, there's no argument about climate change. That, let's not talk about it. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, 
Cl climate change is real, it's a natural phenomenon, but climate and weather are different. So what, what are the climate changes? They said weather and climate are the same. So if there's a storm, a, b a bad hurricane is climate change. Uh, it was pretty hot this summer. Does anybody remember it was a little bit hot in August? But it wasn't as hot as June of, it's either 2010 or 2011, where we were 100 degrees, 102 degrees. And guess what? Modern air conditioning systems don't operate at 102 degrees, okay? And so I guess we could have said back in uh, 2010, climate change has overwhelmed us. But even though it was hot this summer, it wasn't 100 degrees. It was 95 degrees. So climate changes over time, and weather changes in real time, continuously. And try to, try to putting together is what we call false logic. Anybody ever have a basic logic course? So you can move from the general to the specific, but you can't move from the specific to the general. So if someone says there was a hurricane in Florida, it was the worst hurricane anybody ever heard about, that proves there's climate change. They have broken the first law of logic, completely illogical. And you can call them out, that may or may not be true, but it's completely illogical the way you presented it. If we could get students to think in those terms, with the same brain they have, um, they will be absolutely superior. There is a uh, environmentalist in Europe, and I met him, I sat across from lunch one time, and he's, t he's a total environmentalist, okay? And he's, he, he recognizes that there is such a thing as climate change, uh, but he says that there's only one solution, new technologies. And he uses this example. Uh, I, after I got out of Vietnam, I was in uh, LA for f five years. And the smog in LA between 1970 and 1975 was unbelievably bad, absolutely terrible. And all the horses and men couldn't figure out what to do with it, okay? It just became, the problem became worse. No matter whatever they did, it, it got worse. Until somebody invented the catalytic converter. And when the catalytic converter was, was invented, it largely solved the smog problem in Los Angeles. So his point is, yes, um, back to Julian Simon, we, as a country, we can overcome every single problem, but it comes from individuals and individual groups. Uh, it, it doesn't come from spending massive amounts of government spending. So here we have some, I don't know what state uh, the catalytic converter was, conver it was invented in, I don't think it was in California. Somebody invents something that has a profound impact on our environment. That's the way we deal with climate change. So if it's hotter outside, we design, Captive Air does this today, we can design HVAC systems that work at 105 degrees, <laughs> okay? So you say, well, it's really hot outside, but not in my apartment, or not in my house. So individuals with brains solve problems. It's, it's a core concept. It's a core concept of Thales. It's the reason that Thales is as successful as it is. So the only real solution, <laughs> for example, uh, one of my relatives told me, well, obviously you just don't understand windmills. And I said, well, I think I understand them. And they don't make any sense uh, because there are fan laws. And so when you get a data point on a windmill, it's at the maximum RPM, produces X. That's the data point you get. How often do you think those fans run at maximum? Mostly never, there's exceptions. The fan law says, as the RPM dials down, it's not linear. It's a non-linear equation. So a 20% drop in RPM is a 50% drop in energy production. Non-linear. Did you ever hear that before? It's a fan law. There's, there's several fan laws that are indisputable. You can, you can want to debate them, there's nothing to debate. Um, they also kill the whales, as we know, from, uh, um, experimentally, observation, okay? Um, they cause potentially environmental changes. When you put a whole bunch of them in a particular environment, the environment's gonna change. That's, that's a type of climate change. 
Uh, if you look at um, cars today because of regulation, we're going to regulate so that the people will be safer. Uh, the first car I bought, a brand new car in college, was $1,500. Now, you, you, you're going to laugh. You're going to say, that guy must be 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the second car when I was out of college was a Chevy Impala, which they still make today. Nice car, $2,800. This is a really nice car, $2,800. How much does a Chevy Impala cost today? $60,000, $70,000. There's only one car in the U.S. produced today that's $20,000 or less. There's, a, there's one of these imported cars <clears throat> is around $20,000. You probably won't be able to buy one because you can't find them, but they, theoretically they exist. So this idea that we're going to help the little people by regulating safety, et cetera, and now you have a strike with the, United, the auto workers. What the heck do you think is going to happen to the cost of cars? And you have mass, so now the government's saying uh, under, we're going to make it nicer for everybody. We're going to go all electric. Everybody's going to have an electric car. Don't go on any long trips, just do, do short trips. <laughs> and the car companies are putting mass and mass, and the car companies and industries are following the lead of MMT from the government. And they're investing massive amount of money in battery plants and in EVs. And for most people, they're going to say, this is terrific. You know, we're making this transition. I have a relative who's a very smart engineer, said there will be no gasoline cars in 2027. I said, well, don't bet the farm on it, OK? Don't, don't make any bets on that. Uh, recently, last week, Ford announced that a government-sponsored with money from the feds and the state and from Ford, a battery plant in Michigan in the middle of the strike was shuttered. Has anybody heard that? So this modern day, we've got, we got to build it as fast as we can, battery plant. They call it paused. Pause means shuttering in common language. Uh, so I'm trying to give you some of the impacts. When the government spends lots of money and they have lots of mandates to make everybody live a happier, healthy life, How's that working at the grocery store in terms of prices? Not too good. How's it working with your car? For the average person in Wake County today, there virtually aren't any $300,000 homes. Okay, so there's homes being built that you would think I would pay, um, maybe pay $300,000 for the home. Uh, they're $550,000. Uh, the first home I bought in Wake County in Raleigh Brand spanking new, beautiful home, $35,000. So think about that in terms of the impact on economics of individuals, it's enormous. So your kids grow up, they're gonna say, hey, mom, dad, I can't afford a house. I have to live in an apartment. So now you're seeing these sort of secondary consequences. Does anybody think we're overbuilding on apartments? Everywhere you look, you see apartments. Was that the American dream when you grew up? No way in heck. As a matter of fact, in Harrisburg, when I lived there, there was one apartment building, and it was kind of a low end. It's like you live there until you can get enough money to, to buy a house. Okay. And I would say I delivered newspapers there. They were aspiring to buy a house. They weren't aspiring to live in an apartment building for life. So you're seeing the impact and the enormous adverse impact of really bad ideas that are heavily promoted. And if you only listen to certain news channels, I won't name them, you probably know who they are. When you hear it over and over again, you get worn down, okay? We all get worn down at times, mentally, physically, and you start believing in nonsense. Now, if you went back, um, government needs to invest in medicine because it's too expensive. So I can remember these debates going on uh, in the 1950s. And we had a friend who was a radiologist, really good radiologist. And of course, he was opposed to any government intervention because he wanted the doctors to run the hospital and he didn't want bureaucrats running the hospital. And he and my dad would have discussions. My dad was pretty much on the same page. But the idea was, uh, and we grew up in a relatively 
low family, low income family, but we did have health insurance. Seemed to work out okay. We had the normal uh, things that would go on, seemed fine to me. But the political was at the time, we need a government intervention to, to help all the little people, all the people that don't have any income. So let's look at what happened historically with these goofy ideas. And this is part of monetary, monetary theory. In 1960, we spent 5% of GDP on medicine, on healthcare. And keep in mind that in 1960, we're, we're only 15 years out of World War II. We're in a good economy, we're not in a modern economy, a robust economy. We only spent 5.7%. And for most people, healthcare was reasonable. Uh, matter of fact, if you had no money, you could go to a hospital even at that time and they would treat you. They would, by law, have to treat you. By 1987, um, 27 years later, the cost in terms of GDP doubled to 11%. And then 2010, with the advent of affordable care, 17%. And now it's pushing toward 20%. So one out of five dollars is going to medicine. Uh, if you went to a practitioner 10 years ago, they might have charged you $75 for a, a visit. Now they're connected with the hospital, they charge you $300. And, they, and you get a little discount. It's only $240. And the insurance company pays an amount and then you pay the rest. I just checked it full all in a Captivir and Thales for a family plan and to end dentist. You're paying about $6,500. It's an incredible amount of money. It's just unthinkable amount of money. Captivir ran, and you're on the same plan we are. That's why we combined them, self-insured. So we have administrators trying to drive down cost. And if you, if you looked at 1985 when we began, insurance was dirt cheap, literally. Nobody even thought about it, okay? Maybe you paid 20 bucks a month as a single, or maybe you paid 125, 150 bucks as a family. What was it? Nobody thought about it. It was a non-issue. So we took a non-problem and we took monetar modern monetary theory and we just destroyed the cost structure of automobiles, housing, medicine, and education. Okay? Think of the cost of education. Uh, at that conference that I mentioned, the Great Hearts, it turned out I wasn't able to go, but they wanted me to go to meet with a bunch of charter school operators and they said, there's no place in the planet that's doing what Captive or Thales is doing at the price you're doing it. And nobody, they, nobody thinks it's real. <laughs> but, we, but we would like to learn more about it. It's been pretty interesting, right? Uh, because government has ballooned the cost of, of education to unthinkable levels. Even pushing 40, 50,000 a student in New York, 25, 30,000 in DC. And guess what? They're not learning anything. So we're creating millions and millions of people who eventually will be on welfare. So this uh, welfare grows exponentially if individuals are not educated. This is all created by the government. You devoted your life to education. You know how important it is. You know it's doable. It can be really hard. Well, some students are terrifically hard. <laughs> some of those terrifically hard students, and probably me being one of them, uh, turn out okay. <laughs> so we can't give up hope on them. Um, so we have a, in medicine today, think about the, the COVID vaccine. Uh, Captive Air was engaged in the lawsuit that we won in the Supreme Court that said you don't have to take the vaccine based on a Joe Biden executive order mandate. <laughs> and it was, it was signed by, not by the name Captive Air, it was signed by five Texas Captive Air employees. And I said to him, before you sign this, let me tell you, all hell could come loose on you. You could be harassed by every reporter in the world. You could be hated in the neighborhood, ditto, ditto. So don't sign it unless you think it through. And to a one, they said, we don't care. We want to sign it. That's what makes America. That's what makes us such a beautiful country. There are some people who have the courage of their convictions 
Desmet in his book, which uh, I'll put the reference on the bottom of these slides when we send it to you, says that 5% of the people, the courageous leaders, the individuals you are developing right here in this school, are the ballast against the barbarians, which he categorizes about 30% of the people are just some level of being barbarians, troublemakers, uh, street people, whatever they are, that 5% keeps society in a, a reasonable level of balance. So it's very important that we develop those courageous 5% leaders. So think about this cabal where the government's gonna mandate that you're gonna take a drug that's not well tested, that we don't have case law on, never happened in the history of uh, America, and they're gonna spend billions and billions of dollars to buy it, and if you don't do it, they're gonna fire you. So Captive Air, we issued an order in saying, I don't care if the Supreme Court, if we lose in the Supreme Court, you do not have to take the vaccine. It's a matter of personal conviction, and you do not have to take it, and you will not lose your job. You know how much goodwill that brought? People were like, I like this, okay? And no matter what happened, I said, they can haul me out of here. I don't care. You do not have to take that vaccine. It's the type of conviction that we need with the 5% because it's not gonna exist anywhere else, okay? Desmond makes it very, very clear. He studied this subject his whole life. A little sidebar on Desmond. Grows up in Belgium. Pretty liberal place, right? His dad tells him, do not go to the university. There is no truth here. What does he do? He goes to the university. <laughs> <laughs> but ringing is in his ear is what his dad told him. There's no truth over there. So he knew that he had to be a true seeker. It's a, it's a beautiful outcome. And it also shows you the value of good parenting. Um, my friend uh, Bijan from uh, Duke grew up in Romania under communism. He knows what was talked about today. So also, he knows what that's all about. And here's what his dad told him. Don't walk away from the crowd, run. Okay, what is MMT? It's the crowd, it's the cabal. It's the cabal that undermined the cost of cars, the cost of uh, medicine, pretty much anything we buy. I don't know if you're aware of this, but in North Carolina they have a law called CON, Certificate of Need. So you come up with a great idea, you're a great American, you want to open a hospital. You say, man, I can, I'm gonna do something amazing here. And then you find out, well, in order to do that, you have to have the approval of the state of North Carolina. And so you say, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll just go down there and get approval. So you go down there and you file um, for this new hospital. And here's what's going to happen. Duke, UNC, and others are going to come down and say to the state, if it's really determined that we need a new innovative hospital, Duke should do it because we're the incumbent. We know best and you will not be allowed to build that hospital. It's called Certificate of Need. Has anybody ever heard of that law before? A few people. Can you imagine this? In our um, Muskogee plant, it's in an industrial park, but behind the industrial park is what I would call farmland. It's right off in the main highway. And I see this just magnificent building going up. And I thought, and so finally I figured out, well, who's building this building? It's just unbelievably nice. It's American Indians who said, we were relegated to the county hospital. They're not doing a good job. We're gonna build our own hospital. They built their own hospital. No certificate of need in Oklahoma. See the beauty of it? And now they have this magnificent hospital and all the American Indians can go there and then get very superior health care uh, because they're not restricted by the government. The government knows best for you. So MMT restricts private production. Sir. I like that. Um, <laughs> That's where we're trying to get to. It's simple. 
It works for the government. It's, it's that simple. It works for the government. So the, so the believers that the government is the answer? They, they believe the government's the answer for all problems. Completely. So there's an I just looked up a sidebar, um, and it said that there was a conference of 50 PhD economists, and they took a vote on how many believed in MMT. Zero. <laughs> I thought, well, that's encouraging. You had a question? I was just going to add, um, I, I don't think it's just, well, just government. Well, it's about how And basically, the, uh, the founders, if you can Google this, it's called the American System. So if you go back to 1820, they had the American System, and these guys wanted uh, government and business to work together. That's what you have in the pharma industry today. And who gets screwed? Everybody buys a product, gets screwed, basically is what happens. The founders wanted no part of that. And so for 100 years, we didn't have any connection of that nature. Now you have, <clears throat> you saw it in North Carolina over gambling. The gambling interest held up the budget, our, our school scholarships for three months. They held up raises to the teachers and we defeated them. They'll, they'll be back again. So you're seeing evidence of this, this relationship and it's a very unhealthy relationship and everybody loses except those special interests. Everybody comes more poor. So I'll, I'll try to summarize. So education has degraded over the last 50 years with government invention, interventions. We knew this 40 years ago. It's nothing new. We try to pretend it's not happening. Now, people have said to me from the beginning, well, if Thales can do it, we know the public schools can do it also. And I said, well, this just hasn't proven to be true. So it's so illogical. If they've been around for 100 years, why is it then next week they're going to be a Thales? It's never going to happen. That's the short answer. So now it comes that we can have discussion. $33 trillion in debt. It's an unthinkable amount. Based on current 10-year rate, we would be paying $1.5 trillion for life. And it could get a lot worse because as the government gets more control, interest rates will get higher and inflation will get higher. They suck the life out of the economy. Welcome to Argentina. Read Argentinian history, read Venezuelan history, read South American history. Uh, the federal budget proposed the 6.9 billion. Uh, we can't even collect 5 trillion, okay? So there's a t 2 billion disparity, and that disparity will get worse, not better. Um, so essentially, you end up with a sea of debt. You end up with the um, the dollar losing its value, people lose confidence in it. There's already one agency uh, that downgraded the dollar from AAA to something a little bit less. And the powers to be, like how dare them criticize what we're doing? They're not allowed to criticize what we're doing. We're the experts. So I, I hope you can leave with the idea that you have a brain, you have a God-given good brain. You can process information, you can think on your own, you can gain more information, and you can outthink the PhDs every day of the week. That's the message. And mon monetary theory is one of the stupidest ideas in the history of the world. Every one of us will, it's, a, it's not even a theory, it's just a, a dumb idea. It's, it's not, every one of us will be punished throughout our lifetime because of it. And if you're not willing to stand up and fight these people and be part of the 5%, and you are because you're here. <laughs> um, that's how the world changes. So that's my presentation. I appreciate it. Nobody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs>